I want to start by uh, finishing off the energy lecture that we worked on last week and the week before. Um, so we've been talking about energies for biomolecules, energies for proteins, and we talked about um, that uh, the energy is, uh, well, we could do things with quantum, but that's really difficult, so we tend to go for a molecular mechanics type approach where we have several different pieces of energy and then we sum those pieces together. We talked last week about van der Waals energies. We talked, what else? Electrostatic energies. We talked about hydrogen bonds. Um, the major piece I want to talk about today to kind of wrap these up is, is to talk about solvation energies. Um, which is perhaps one of the most uh, confusing pieces. I'll try to make it a little more clear. So solvation energy, uh, and we, when we did the brainstorming a couple days ago, people mentioned this. They also mentioned things like the hydrophobic force. Uh, we also mentioned entropy. Well, all of this is kind of together under things that are driven by the solvent. The fact that the protein is not just a protein moving in space, but it's surrounded by solvent molecules or water molecules, and the energies of those, the energies and conformations and orientations of those molecules affect the energy of the whole system. So the solvation energy is actually a combination of various effects that come out of the fact that the, the solvent is made of molecules itself. Um, it's also an energy that's still somewhat poorly understood. There's been a lot of studies on it. There's a lot of good theoretical knowledge, but exactly how to get it to interact with the protein in a, in a um, careful, quantitative, and complete way is, is somewhat difficult. So uh, it's, it's a combination of a few different effects. Um, so let's talk about that. One is that uh, the protein or any kind of solute would make this hydrophobic pieces, or it takes up some kind of volume, hydrophobic volume, uh, and if when you take this out of the vacuum and you put it into a solvent, so if here's some solvent, to transfer this into solvent, the first thing you need to do is get the solvent out of the way, so you have to create a hole, create a hole for uh, this with a uh, solute to fit into. So this is gonna require some kind of free energy just to move the water out of the way. So this is the energy to create a cavity in water. So it actually has nothing to do with whether this is hydrophobic or hydrophilic or anything else. It's just getting, making space out of the way uh, to put the molecule in. So to do this, um, you know, water is always moving around, and if you think of, uh, if you've had statistical mechanics, and you think of molecules uh, being in all kinds of different conformations, and the ensemble is all different combinations of uh, coordinates where the waters can be, in some of those uh, uh, instances in the ensemble, there might be a spontaneous hole that opens up. So this is surely happening as the solid molecules move around, there's holes that open up. And that happens just because there's different configurations that might just allow a hole. So really what you want is to pull out ones that have a big enough hole to stick a protein in. Um, because this has nothing to do with the entropy and it just has to do with the arrangement of the waters, um, this is purely an entropic term asking how often in water do you see a fluctuation where you have a cavity there. So thermodynamically it's equivalent to the same question and the people who study this on a on a rigorous statistical mechanics basis, look at how often do you get these holes opening up. And you can imagine the bigger the hole you need, the less often you're going to see that. So that's one part of the energy is creating a cavity in the water. Um, yeah, so then we also have uh, burying polar groups. So if we have a, say, a lysine uh, that has a side chain that um, might be positively charged, if that's unfolded and there's waters around it, the water might arrange itself to compensate for that positive charge by putting the negative charge in the water molecule toward that 
side chain. So um, that might be favorable in solvents. These water molecules are very uh, 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 movable, and so they move around with ease, and the dielectric constant of water is 80, meaning there's a lot of uh, permittivity and a lot of uh, ability for that solvent to rearrange. Now, if we take that protein and fold it and put that lysine in the middle of a protein and it's buried, well, the water still has dielectric of 80, but the protein has a low dielectric where energy of the protein could be anywhere from 1 to 20, depending on which models um, we believe. But certainly uh, an oil, like a pure hydrophobic phase, would be on the order of 1 to, one to 4. So uh, it's going to be a lot lower dielectric. There's not a dipoles that can rearrange. And uh, it's going to be more difficult to, uh, uh, to, to have that point charge in that medium. So this is uh, also referred to as the Born energy, or the Born self-energy. energy uh, simply refers to the electrostatic equations that if you were to take an ion and you put it in a dielectric, how much energy does that take to do? Okay, and last, um, uh, so, so this is for burying polar groups. We compare that with burying nonpolar groups. So if we have uh, an unfolded state and say a valine and we have waters around there and we have a, a phenylalanine and then we take that unfolded state and fold it into a protein and now maybe we bury these hydrophobics and the, uh, the hydrophobics are in the middle and the shapes are complementary and so in this case we have a lot of surface area around here where waters have to be around the hydrophobics, whereas inside here we're minimizing the surface area and we're packing these together. So um, where there are hydrophobic areas and there, uh, water's unable to hydrogen bond, you could end up with some water structuring around these hydrophobic areas, which would um, so you get water structuring around exposed hydrophobic surface area. Um, and in the folded state, we have less exposed uh, surface area. Okay. So this kind of leads to a view um, that might be akin to in the macro scale surf a surface tension. But we're just looking to minimize the surface area and have less surface area for the water to be structured around. So that's more relevant for the, the hydrophobic pieces. Part of why it's hard to quantify because you're looking at different physical pieces. It's a little unclear how to add these together. Certainly the entropic piece uh, has to be averaged over whole statistical ensembles of different configurations of the molecules of the solvents and that's difficult to capture and model. Um, so what's going to happen? We're going to have a few models that can incorporate different parts of these, uh, these contributions. So one of the easiest is a solvent accessible surface area model. Uh, which is also called SASA, S-A-S-A, -S -A, Solvent Accessible Surface Area. Um, this is from um, Eisenberg and McLaughlin and Cole and Delarue. <coughs> this is going back a little ways. This is 94 and 86. Um, and so the, the surface, the surface tension is a little bit funny because um, it's not like in the macro scale where you're doing a bubble and you and you have a macroscopic property. This is really, um, you know, there's individual water molecules here. Um, so the notion that a continuum model makes sense is a little bit a little bit funny. Um, 
but it turns out it works in some cases and you can get some kind of correspondence to it so people do use it even though we're definitely at the range where the, the continuous assumption should be breaking down we should be getting to the um, well we are on the molecular scale here but this is so so how is this done on the molecular scale um, what we do is we take the protein atoms and we um, We're basically going to look at what is the surface area that a water molecule could get to. So if you look at a water molecule, um, you're going to have a diameter of 1.4 angstroms for a sphere that would represent water. And we're going to bring that down against these atoms, and then we're going to roll it around the surface. And as we roll, we'll get, we'll capture this edge of this molecule, and then eventually that water molecule will get caught between these two atoms and you'll have this edge and again on top here and then this piece here. So we're going to roll this along and as we roll we're capturing what the surface is in three dimensions as we roll this around. So the algorithm uh, will come down to looking at these spheres and how far they are apart and how the water spheres can be in between, I'm drawing it in 2D, but it, it'll be 3D in the algorithms. Uh, and eventually, and, and so we'll have these radii of the ad heavy atoms from the protein from data, and then we'll use this 1.4 angstrom as this water probe to roll around. And then at the end of the day, we're going to take the surface area for each one of these pieces and add them up. It'd be different if it's, say, a carbon atom versus an oxygen atom, because a carbon atom would be hydrophobic, and we'd want to not have that surface area but an oxygen or a nitrogen that's hydrophilic, we would want that surface area, so we want to weight those differently. So our energy will be approximated by summing over each atom I times call an atomic solvation parameter for atom I, so that's the number that we different for carbon or oxygen, and the sign will be different, times the accessible surface area of that ion I. This is atomic solvation parameter. And this is accessible surface area. This is somewhat slow to calculate. Well, it's relative to something. Relative to the van der Waals, where you're just looking at the distance between and you calculate a number there, this is slower because you're going to have to figure out all this geometry of where all these curves are and then do the sections of the spheres, figure out how much area is there. So this algorithm is slower than van der Waals. It's faster than Poisson Boltzmann, where you're solving a continuum equation, um, but it's slower than that. Um, but that, it's slow to calculate, but there are also, there exist faster methods. So are there ways to speed it up, say by putting points in space and figuring out which points get covered up. So there's some ways that this calculation has been accelerated. If we look at the numbers, if we look at atoms, um, the atomic solvation parameter. So carbon is 16 plus or minus two calories <coughs> per angstrom squared <coughs> per mole. This is coming from the Cole and Delarue. Whereas nitrogen and oxygen are minus six plus or minus four for a neutral nitrogen or oxygen. So a charged oxygen, minus 24. Charged nitrogen, minus 50. And sulfur hydrophobic, so back to 21, a positive value. So the negative values, those want to be exposed to solvent, the positive values do not want to be exposed to solvent. So, so this is one algorithm we use in Rosetta. Typically we don't use that till the end of a calculation because it's slower and we want to save that at the end. During a calculation we need something fast. <coughs> because we're looking for something fast, um, we like a pairwise calculation where you simply have to go over all pairs of atoms and look at how their interactions together. Um, contribute. So I want to talk about the pairwise effective energy um, function for solvation.
Commission. This is also called the uh, Gaussian exclusion model. Uh, the effective energy function is EEF1. It's also what it goes by, and this is by Lazaridis, Nemes Lazaridis, who's a chemical engineer. Martin Karplus, we talked about before, we got the Nobel Prize last year. This was published in 99. And how this works is we have, so we have a carbon atom, and another carbon atom. And as these carbon atoms come together, we want to look at how that potential varies with distance between these atoms. So again, we have this Rij between the atoms. And what happens? As it comes together, we're going to make it less likely that we see solvent atoms in between here. And that's what this is going to look at. So this is going to look at the, the Gaussian flex, the rate, it's called Gaussian as it looks at fluctuations in atoms, like a Gaussian distribution, it looks how the waters fluctuate around. And so, like in the, uh, like in the surface area model, consider that there's waters outside, except now they're not just rolling around the surface, but they're in different places. And um, let's see, you can get this water molecule, the center of this water molecule can get up to uh, the radius of the carbon atom plus the radius of the water molecule is how close it can get. And as these two carbons get closer, you can get up to a point where you completely exclude waters from between them. Um, and so that creates a depletion force where you'll have waters on the outside but nothing on the inside that's going to pull things together. Um, let's see, so um, we're going to exclude water from the first shell. Uh, so, it's, so depending on how close these are, this is going to exclude water from interacting with the atoms. And this is going to happen as a function the distance between those two atoms. Okay, and that's where the math is going to be based on for this model. Okay, there's quite a bit of stat mech that goes into the derivation, so I'm not going to do that, but I am going to show you what the outcome looks like and talk about what some of the terms mean. So the delta G of solvation of ion I in this Lazarus Car Plus model looks like this. There's a delta G I ref, and this is the energy of a fully solvated I, uh, uh, fully solvated atom. So if atom I is on its own, it's all alone. The energy of that would be delta G. I ref is the reference energy of a solvated atom. And then every time another atom comes in, it's going to exclude water molecules. And excluding the water molecules, pushing those away, there's going to be either a penalty or a reward for that. So we're going to sub subtract and we're going to sum over each ion J that's different from, or each atom J that's different from the atom I. A function um, that's dependent on the atom type I and depend on the distance Rij between them. So we'll have this distance between them and it's also gonna depend on the volume of atom J. So atom J is gonna have some volume that it's gonna bring in and exclude water. And then this function with distance is gonna tell us how much water it excludes as it gets closer and closer. And then Fi Rij looks like this. Alpha I e to the minus Xij squared over 4 pi rij squared. Uh, so now rij is the distance um, between two ions. Um, xij is rij minus, sorry, ri minus a capital ri, which is a radius, some kind of radius of the atom. So we're really looking at we're going to subtract off the radius of an atom and now look kind of at the gap between these. Um, divided by lambda i, which is a screening length, which tells how fast this stuff's going to die off. So this 
this is an exponential die-off, and here's the Gaussian statistics, e to the x squared, that's the, that looks like a Gaussian. Um, so this will die off with distance, there's an rij on the bottom, and then alpha i equals 2 delta g i free over root i lambda i, that lambda i again is the screening distance of how fast this screens off with as you go further away. Uh, lambda i is typically, well, they plug in 3.5 angstroms or 6 angstroms. So in general that's saying <coughs> the atoms are feeling the first or second shell of waters. Um, and this delta g free, this is our other parameters. So the two main parameters are delta g i and then delta g free that go with the atom. And what the delta g free does is say as we bring, um, uh, as we bring uh, atoms in and bury things, it's going to bring, um, so as we bury the atom, the total uh, delta g solvation goes to zero. So that the delta g i is going to be, uh, uh, the reference energy will be positive for hydrophilic atoms like carbon and want to not be there. And then as we bring in other things to bury that carbon, this delta g free is going to be uh, positive again. So we're going to subtract that off and the energy gets <coughs> lower and lower until it gets to zero because we've de desolvated it. For a charged uh, ion, this would be a for a charged atom, this would be a negative number because it likes to be solvated. And then as we bring in more and more atoms to bury it, this will give me a negative number. The negative times the negative will be a positive, and we'll go toward uh, a neutral again, we'll go toward zero when it's totally when it's totally buried. All right. So I went through that a lot, you, and you don't need to know all of these things and their meaning. I think what's important to know is that DG ref is this reference energy of an ion that's in the solvent, and then this DG free represents the energy as it gets buried, and then it's getting buried um, by each of the pairwise uh, interactions of atoms coming in. Let's see, so um, these numbers are all tabulated in Lazarus Car Plus in table one as the DG ref, DG P values. Those are also in Rosetta. Um, the total energy in Rosetta, when you do the energy of solvation, it's going to be a sum over each atom I of this delta G solvation of atom I will be a sum of the delta G I ref minus the sum over all I J delta G in this, uh, of solvation IJ. So the way this will come out is that each atom will have its own, when we, when we do the sum over the whole protein, each atom will have its own reference energy for the single atoms, and then there'll be pairwise contributions for each of the pairs that you bring together. So atom J will affect I, and I will affect J, and you can think of that as coming together to do a total energy of the combination. That's what we'll see in the code. All right, any questions about this model? This has been expanded to be done in the membranes. There's now a, Lazarus has a model. <coughs> I haven't helped know too much about that. It's a little more complicated because of the membrane. It is hydrophobic and it's going into the membrane. So, so this has been a pretty effective, and it's, it's also fast, so that's helpful. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is energies and forces. So we put a bunch of equations on for energies. So if we know the energy, how do we get the force? That's the question. How are force and energy related? So force is a vector. How do we get the effect of force out of the energy? Physicist. Derivative. We're going to take the gradient of the energy. If we have some equation for the total energy, we can take the gradient of that energy, it'll give the force and it'll have a direction to it also. So if I have two atoms, I and J, C 
the distance r between them. And the energy is a function of r. We get the force is the gradient of the energy with respect to r is the first derivative f, the derivative of f with respect to r. Uh, let's see what else. Derivative with respect to the distance r, and then this would be in the direction. This would be in the direction. This is going to be in the direction of the vector between these two atoms. So how is the force felt internally? So let's say we have I and J are bonded together, and then somewhere over elsewhere in the protein is, is atom K. Actually, let's do it this way because we had I and J there. Let's call that K. Let's say I and J are interacting, but I is bonded to K. And maybe these are uh, repelling. How is that going to push back on this bond toward K? So if we want to say, uh, how is the force along the bond? You'd have to look at the, I missed a sign here, didn't I? It's got to help you with that. Force is the opposite of the gradient of the energy. There should be a sign in there. So let's see. So here the force would be the opposite of dE, um, d r. I, J, that would be the force that's in the direction between the R, I, J's. And uh, let's see if this is R hat, I, J. You really want to know what it looks like toward uh, the I, K direction. So to do that, we would want to multiply this R, J, I dotted with R, I, K unit directions in both of those, the unit vectors in both of those directions, so then that would resolve that force in the other direction. All right, you can consider uh, similarly if, um, if this was bound somewhere, we wanted to look at the force around this torsion angle to turn, that may rotate where I is, you can do a chain rule you could do the chain rule the same way of the end, derivative of the energy between these two and how it would go back toward this torsion angle. Now you're going to have some sines and cosines in there because you've got this, uh, this rotation going on. All right, uh, questions about forces and energies? What else? Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is a reference state. As we're summing this up, a couple things to mention. A, a reference state, there's no such thing as an absolute energy. At least absolute zero doesn't really make any sense for biomolecules. So a reference state depends on a comparison. So we really need two states to compare the energy. So we really want confirmation. One versus confirmation two, or sequence one versus sequence two, or um, yeah, you really want two different states, maybe folded versus unfolded. Um, so you want to think about, at least with all these energy functions, if you're calculating them wrong, you want to think about where was the reference energy, what, what was the zero for this particular calculation. So we, in the Lazarus car plus, that was pretty explicit, the zero stuff far apart. You know, that's the, the DG ref energy. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it. So I offered all these pieces. Um, one of the tricky things about proteins is proteins keep a lot of these forces in balance. So oftentimes the electrostatics and the attractive van der Waals are carefully balanced with the solvation forces that are maybe pulling things apart. So a lot of times these things are carefully balanced and as you calculate them you have to have good numbers for all of them to get the right net positive or negative number at the end of the day. So the balance and, and precision on these calculations is pretty important and like I said as a field we keep refining these models and finding better models to estimate the energies.